this is the DS Automobile DS7 E Tense, a facelifted version of a car formerly known as the DS7 Crossback. What has changed besides the name, and who is this car for? Let's find out. L'amour avec un grand A, celui qu'on se sert C'est après les mômes qu'il commence pour de vrai Dans les débuts, c'est l'envie d'obi On se promet tout et ça pour la vie Les mots les plus doux, les projets d'avenir Romance petit déj au réveil dans le lit Très attentionné, attentionné Au flair d'une grossesse, dans la tête ça chauffe sans cesse DS Automobiles, or Automobile, is one of 14 automotive brands owned by the Stellantis Group. In 2009, Citroën announced the introduction of the DS Sub brand. The name refers to the iconic DS model from the 1950s and the 1960s and is meant to be associated with luxury. The first models were called Citroën, DS3, 4, Citroën, DS5, etc. And then DS became a standalone brand, which, judging by the long lettering on the tailgate, has to be spelled out, just in case. Other exterior changes include simplified headlights that no longer do the welcome dance, and enlarged daytime running lights. DS is very proud of these and calls them the light veil. I recall when I drove the pre-facelift model, my neighbor was convinced it was some sort of Chinese import. In my opinion, the facelifted DS has a more refined design, and if I didn't know what I was looking at, my first association would be with the Audi Q5, with which, by the way, the DS7 directly competes, and not just with Audi. The DS7, here, in its most powerful 360 horsepower PHEV form, competes not only with the Audi Q5, but also with the BMW X3, Lexus NX, Mercedes-Benz GLC or Volvo XC60, all of which can be ordered with a plug-in hybrid powertrain and offer similar performance, even if the DS7 is the smallest of the pack. But it has the largest boot. Regardless of the powertrain, it's 555 liters because the traction battery and the rear motor fit under the rear seat and slightly partly under the boot floor. The only thing missing from the regular internal combustion engine variant is a mini spare. This test unit also lost the double floor, but I have a feeling it was left behind in the press office after the car wash. There are clearly tabs to hold the floor raised. Other than that, there is one shopping bag hook to satisfy nagging car journals, a 12 volt outlet and levers to fold the backrest in the second row. Just behind the boot sill is a small storage compartment under the floor. Unfortunately, it's too small to fit a charging cable because Stellantis gives you a huge brick. The tailgate is electrically operated, but for some mysterious reason, this limited La Première edition doesn't get the opening and closing with gesture. And the tailgate still opens too low, and I'm only 175 centimeters tall. How? Doors cover the sills. Rear legroom and headroom are sufficient. There is also flat floor in the middle. Unfortunately, with the driver's seat set to the lowest position, there is hardly any room left for my feet. The backrest angle can be electrically adjusted. There are large door pockets and cup holders in the armrest but there is no ski hatch and the backrest splits 40-60. Isofix anchor points are only on the rear side seats. And as in the pre-facelift version, also here we have like a fake third zone climate control. The rear passenger can control the air conditioning for the entire cabin rather than just for the rear part. USB ports are a plus though. The DS7 cockpit remained largely unchanged. There is a lot of rhombus or 
diamond shapes throughout. Elegant stitching on the dash, a large display in front of the driver and another one here in the center. The driver's display can present data in one of several modes. Even five years ago, the graphics were past expiry date. So today we can pretend they're old school, like playing River Raid. The central display is not polarized sunglasses friendly, but let's say I can get a different pair of sunglasses. I recall the pre-facelift version of the infotainment system lacked a home screen, which this one finally has. I still don't get it why changing the climate control settings requires clicking on the shortcut button under the display and then clicking on the display, but I can always ask the rear passenger to set the temperature for everyone on board. As long as Android Auto works, I'm fine, and I know it should be wireless, but for some reason for me it only works with a cable. Good thing it works at all, because DS SatNav is hardly class leading. Like in most plug-in hybrids, also here we have a menu section dedicated to charging, recharging, maintaining charge, etc. The seats are very comfortable, I get the impression something changed versus the pre-facelift model, perhaps it's the um, reach adjustment of the steering column, it's now longer. However, I'm not sure whether the seat should move this much. Very 90s Americana. Also, huge door pockets, a monstrous storage compartment under the armrest, and a deep glove box. Somewhere above the driver's left knee are buttons for semi-autonomous driving, mirror settings, tailgate release, heating schedule activation, and something that DS considers windshield heating, as well as to open the filler flap. Behind the steering wheel is a cruise control joystick. I know owners of French cars are delighted with this solution, and yet I think some car makers somehow manage to fit everything on the steering wheel. Perhaps there is a better way of doing it, but what do I know? Meanwhile, on the steering wheel, there are just a few buttons and they are piano black, so screw your OCD. On top of the steering column is a camera monitoring the driver's attention. On the tunnel, next to the cup holders, there are buttons for power windows and central locking. This car has been on the press fleet for a while now, and I'm very close to getting a vacuum cleaner and cotton buds to clean up this mess. It looks beautiful, but only when it's brand spanking new. Below the center display is a wireless charger and USB ports. Above the display is an analog clock and a start button, which after a week of driving the DS, I still can't get used to. First of all, I can never find it. And then it's not enough to just press it, but you have to press it and hold it for a while. So the car really understands you want to turn it on or off. Several years ago, I reviewed a front-wheel drive DS7 Crossback with a 180 horsepower diesel. The only diesel remaining after the facelift is a 130 horsepower front-wheel drive, but only with an automatic transmission. And all the petrol engines now are plug-in hybrids, starting with a 225 horsepower front-wheel drive through 300 and 360 horsepower, the latter two being all-wheel drive. All these are pretty familiar within the former PSA brands. For example, we've seen the 225 horsepower front-wheel drive version in the Peugeot 308 or DS4. Opel Grandland X used to be offered with a 300 horsepower all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid until it lost the X and all-wheel drive. And the 360 horsepower version was used in the Peugeot 508 PSE. And within the Stellantis group now, we also have the Alfa Romeo Tonale PHEV with all-wheel drive and 280 horsepower. Although these are largely similar powertrains, each of the models I reviewed has completely different handling characteristics and real-world performance is not always on par with manufacturers' figures, usually not to the customer's advantage. With that said, the DS7 is actually quite good compared to its uh, Stellantis brethren.
the e 10 4x4 360 model I'm reviewing here should accelerate from 0 to 100 km per hour in 5.6 seconds. I was able to achieve 5.8 seconds in sport mode. For a Stellantis PHEV, this is basically factory spec. And the 80 to 120 km per hour time should be 3.4 seconds, but I achieved 3.3 seconds. The car starts in electric mode, as long as there is enough power in the traction battery, and you can drive up to 140 km per hour on electric motor alone, but pressing the accelerator harder still starts the combustion engine. Meanwhile, Toyota and Lexus plugins will do VMAX in electric mode and will not switch to hybrid mode until the battery runs out or you press the right button. The DS7 has a 14 kWh traction battery. Again, every Stellantis model seems to have a different battery capacity from about 11 to about 15 kWh. The promised range is 62 km in the city or 57 km in the combined cycle. I never got close to 60. I was usually in the low 50s. I charged the traction battery every time I parked at home. My daily trips exceeded the electric range, so my average fuel economy as of now is 4.1 liters per 100 kilometers. As standard, the DS7 has a 7.4 kilowatt onboard charger, so from a powerful enough outlet, you'll be fully charged in about two hours. The fuel tank capacity is just 43 liters, so longer journeys will require relatively frequent fuel stops. However, since in daily driving, PHEVs rarely use any fuel, it's good to get some fresh fuel in once in a while. The handling is very confident. The DS7 drives confidently also in the corners, something that cannot be said of the Alfa Romeo Tonale. Uh, soundproofing in the upper part of the cabin is good, but the tire noise comes through from underneath. The active scan suspension seems to be less effective than in the pre facelift model. In theory, there is a camera which should recognize any imperfections on the road ahead and send a signal to the suspension on how to react to them. In practice, the car shakes and sways and on some bumps, even the rear end wobbles, kind of like in the Mercedes cars with adaptive suspension a few years ago. Perhaps the active scan suspension doesn't work well with all wheel drive or it's been otherwise somehow miscalibrated. I also took the DS7 on my diagonal approach test. I stop halfway with the wheels on the diagonal with limited traction and then I try to get going again. The first attempt is in comfort mode. The system doesn't seem to understand what's happening and is just trying to break the rear wheels. The second attempt is in comfort mode with ESP off. In this case, the power just escapes from the system, but there's enough wheel spin to get this almost 1900 kg crossover up the hill. The third attempt is in off-road mode because the DS7 also has an off-road mode. Here the traction control understands what's up and allows a bit more slip, but not too much. Easy peasy. By the way, I suggest you get at least front mudguards fenders behind the front wheels, expose the tires. So even on wet, wet tarmac, you're going to get grit all over the front and rear doors. At the beginning, I said the DS looks to me like an Audi Q5 and that it competes also with cars like BMW X3, Lexus NX, Mercedes-Benz GLC or the Volvo XC60, also in terms of the price. While the base diesel in the lowest Bastille spec starts at €42,490, the top Opera trim with the most powerful plug-in hybrid will set you back around €72,000 
with options to match this no longer available La Premiere Limited Edition. You're going to leave a similar amount with the competition for a plug-in hybrid with comparable performance and equipment. So who is the DS7 for? For someone who wants their car to stand out in a parking lot among other leased SUVs, nobody of sound mind is actually going to buy this car outright. They will probably lease it for two, three years and then get rid of it, in which case I can totally recommend the DS7. And how do you like the DS7? Is the original style right for you or are you team blend in? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.